be them. All right, Acts chapter 28, let's stand together and uh, Brother, Brother Terry, just wave at me. Uh, I, I've, been in, I've been at one meeting in North Carolina. Uh, they've got, a, they've got a, a, a traffic signal in the back. And when you get to about 20 minutes, they put you on yellow. And you're green till you hit 20, and then you, you yell at 20, and then when 25 or 30 comes, it hits red, and you know, praise God, it's time. And I praise the Lord. Listen, Acts chapter 27, let's go back to verse 37, then we'll hit Acts 28. The Bible said we were all in the ship 200, three score and 16 souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the weed into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore, into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. When they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. One of my favorite messages through the years, Brother Hudson preached right there on how not to lose your hinder parts. Amen. And the soldiers counsel verse 42 was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape but the centurion willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded they which could swim should catch themselves first into the sea and get to land and the rest some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship and so it came to pass they escaped all safe to land when they were escaped when they knew that the island was called Melita and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on, the, uh, hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though that he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen dead suddenly, but after that he had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. You can be seated. I want to turn your attention to verse number three, where the Bible said, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. We'll come back to that in just a moment. I want you to keep your Bible open and we'll look back into the text tonight but as you walk into the book of Acts you that have studied the Bible uh, you're aware that as you walk into those first chapters of the book of Acts those first nine ten chapters deal primarily uh, with the ministry of the Apostle Peter and that brand new church that's located there at Jerusalem where man this thing got started that we call the gospel ministry uh, of a brother in Acts chapter number nine there's a man uh, that walks out onto the pages of the gospel ministry uh, and you and I are sitting here tonight with the King James Bible in our hand as a direct result uh, of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, if there ever was a faithful witness that walked across the pages of the word of God to the life changing power of the gospel of the grace of God. A neighbor of the apostle Paul was that man uh, from the day that he met the Lord Jesus uh, on uh, that Damascus road uh, until he sealed his fate in his own blood uh, in that Roman Colosseum. Uh, Paul was a mighty preacher uh, of the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, neighbor, when he set out on that Damascus road, uh, he was being pursued by a past uh, uh, that corrupted him. And when Paul set out on that Damascus road. He was under the impression that he was the hunter until the God of heaven began to speak to him out of that third heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why kickest thou against the pricks? And what Saul realized is the same thing that you and I realized we got under Holy Ghost.
Ghost conviction. Uh, we were not the hunter, uh, but friend, we were the hunted. Aren't you glad for the day uh, when you sat in a building or wherever it was uh, and the Spirit of God arrested your soul uh, and you realized that something uh, bigger than you had got a hold of your life uh, and it got a hold of your spirit. Uh, and friend, with that past that was corrupted him, uh, but when Paul bumped into the Lord, uh, honey, he bumped into a power that would convert him. Uh, and from that very moment on uh, until he would die in that Colosseum, friend, uh, uh, Paul's life uh, uh, was navigated and guided by a purpose uh, uh, that controlled him. Uh, uh, can I tell you, when you look at the story of the Apostle Paul uh, and how Saul became Paul, uh, uh, there's ones of us that are sitting here tonight. Uh, uh, there's grandchildren. There's children. Uh, uh, there's kids who've got spouse, uh, uh, moms and dads that are not saved. Uh, and boy, I hear people say, preacher, have they gone too far? Uh, I know there's a line, Proverbs 1. Uh, I know there's a line, Romans 1. Uh, uh, but Brother Daniel, I don't know where that line is. Uh, and tell you, listen, uh, until the Lord Jesus calls us home, uh, until as long as that door of evangelism is wide open, uh, honey, I'm going to cast the net uh, and invite lost people to be saved. Uh, you say, but preacher, uh, uh, listen, it's been a long time, friend. Uh, uh, can I tell you, Paul, when he got saved, uh, was probably the least likely candidate uh, in that hour, had those writings in his hand uh, uh, to persecute that church. Uh, but God came in uh, and saved him by the grace of God. Uh, uh, you've come a long way late uh, to tell me that God can't take a dirty rotten uh, a low down sinner uh, and save them by the grace of God uh, uh, wash them and listen uh, hey, but one thing I know that can take a black heart uh, uh, wash it in red blood uh, and make it white as snow uh, uh, but friend for the last 30 years uh, uh, God's let me see those sinners uh, uh, get born again uh, and I say mom and I say dad uh, I say grandparent don't give up uh, if God can save Paul uh, he could save your family. Amen. As you look into this passage, Paul is on his way to stand before Caesar. He's on his way. He's going to spend a year as a prisoner in Rome. And then they're going to march him down that cobblestone road. Several years ago, we stood in that Mamatine prison. And we walked out of there and walked down that cobblestone road uh, into that Colosseum. Uh, I don't believe they had to drag Paul down through there. Uh, I don't believe they had to beat him down the road, Brother Jeffrey. Uh, I believe Paul said, praise God. Uh, he died for me. Uh, and I'm honored to die for him. Amen. Uh, I'm telling you, buddy he was ready uh, to seal his faith in his own blood. Uh, can I tell you and I, if we're not careful in this modern day we live in, uh, we have allowed this charismatic mentality uh, to get into our churches uh, uh, that if we'll just get saved uh, and we'll separate, I didn't cuss right there, I said separate uh, ourselves from the world, amen. Uh, I'm talking about live different, uh, uh, walk right, spit right. Uh, uh, men look like men, women look like women. Can I get a witness? Uh, I mean, listen, friend. Uh, if we'll just live right and get saved, uh, serve God, be involved in church, uh, uh, that that's some kind of insulation, uh, uh, that's some kind of shield. Uh, against any difficulty in our Christian life. A uh, uh, friend, you might have got that from Oprah. You might have got that from Kenneth Hagin. Uh, uh, you might have got that off TBN. Uh, uh, but friends, you didn't find that in your King James Bible. Uh, listen, if you think so, uh, uh, talk to Job. Uh, uh, talk to Shadrach. Uh, uh, talk to Meshach the Bendigo. Uh, uh, talk to the disciples. Uh, uh, talk to the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, he said, in this world ye shall have tribulation. Uh, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Uh, Job said a man born of a woman uh, is a few days and full of trouble uh, as the sparks fly upward. Uh, if we're not careful, uh, difficulty and burdens will come uh, and we'll get to thinking man, uh, uh, the Lord ought to treat us better than this uh, or he's holding out uh, or he should do a little bit better. Uh, uh, doesn't he know what we're doing? Uh, uh, friend, we better be careful when we develop that kind of mentality. Are you listening to me? As we look into this story, we need to remember, and nobody ever told you it'd be easy to serve God. Amen. Brother Blair, better brother Edgar told me years ago, he said, son, 
He said, there's going to come a day that you and your generation of young men are going to face devils that I never dreamed of. I mean, that's, that's what he said, Brother Terrell. I mean, listen, brother, you, we, you've still got preacher more, but uh, Brother Edgar and Brother Willard have gone to heaven. Uh, I mean, man, and we're facing things, those men. Uh, I thought, man, I would have never thought we'd have had to face that. Uh, I mean, we're living in difficult hours, uh, and the Lord never told us it was going to be easy. And when you look into Acts 27, 28, uh, uh, you find probably, the, I believe, the greatest preacher uh, since the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, I believe he wrote 14 books of the New Testament. Uh, I mean, Listen, he had been shipwrecked. He had been shackled. He had been striped. He had been snake bit. He had been stranded. But I tell you what you don't find Paul doing. You might have saw him shackled. And you might have saw him floating out there in the water. But friends never did see Paul quit. Amen. I'm telling you, friend, praise God. He refuses to allow the discomforts of this world and the discomforts of this life to cause him to throw in the towel. Oh, listen, oh, Paul decided to keep the fire burning and to shake the lake off. Listen, you may be here tonight, you may be a preacher and you may be a deacon and you may be a bus worker. You may be an evangelist, a missionary, and you feel like your life's battered and you feel like it's bruised and you feel like man a a termite a yo-yo in a tornado amen you don't know up from down you may feel like your life's capsized I'm telling you listen if you don't want to quit you don't have to quit we're living in an hour where men are dropping their colors they're changing signs they're backing up on the Bible God help us give us some grit and give us some determination and God help us not to quit. Amen. Listen real close. You may not be able to keep people from seeing you struggle but you can keep people from seeing you quit. Miss Kim and Miss Renee Every time I see you get on a platform, you bless my heart. Mom in heaven, daddy's in heaven, Micah's in heaven, and not only do you get up there and sing and play, you let me sing with you, that's a real blessing to me. (laughs) Amen. They make anybody sound good, praise God. Are you listening? But you don't do it begrudgingly. You don't do it with a bad spirit. You get up there with the touch of God. Amen. I told Brother Adam the other day, Brother Terrell, Miss, Miss, Miss Angel went to heaven 18 months ago. I, and then he's got, she had two teenage girls, a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old when she went to heaven. And I've watched those girls for the last 18 months uh, uh, get on a platform by their daddy and sing and play. I, I tell you, I said, I don't care if you get all the harmony right. I didn't bother me if you don't get all the notes right. Uh, uh, just seeing you walk up on the platform uh, and take a microphone phone and make a choice it'd been real easy to say man if God you gonna let my mom die I'm out if you don't hear my prayer and touch my mom I'm out but thank God for every time they walk up on a platform and say by the grace of God I may be struggling I may have a broken heart but thank God I'm not gonna quit amen amen I think about the members of the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Your preacher's been your pastor long enough. Most of us preachers are OCD. We all are. We're a choir crowd, praise God. That's a mountain term at home. Not I didn't I didn't say the other word, I said choir. <laughs> and some of them, brother Doug, you've been watching so long. You can tell before they ever get to the pew what kind of morning it's been, what kind of week it's been, what kind of month it's been, what kind of year it's been. See, they they can't keep you from seeing them struggle. 
But I tell you what the blessing is when you know they're struggling and they come on Sunday morning and they come on Sunday night and they come on Wednesday night and they keep putting their tithe in and they keep putting their missions in and they come to choir practice and they come to prayer rooms and they go on mission trips and they come to work days. What I'm telling you is you'll never be able to keep everybody from seeing you struggle but you can keep them from seeing you quit. Three quick things. Number one, I want you to notice the shipwreck that brought them. I mean, how did they get here? It wasn't a cruise liner, friend. It was a shipwreck. I'm telling you that there was an unseen hand that transported them. I'm telling you, when you think all of, the, all of your life is out of control, I'm glad there's a God that rideth upon the storm. I mean, listen, the winds may be blowing you and the waves may be rocking you, but there's a God that lives above the wind and he lives above the storm and he lives above the circumstances of the day and without the aid of charts and without the aid of GPS God took them 500 miles up from where they left and if it had been a few miles this way and a few miles that way they'd been out in the wild blue sea but what about a God who was so in control he could drop them off right exactly where they needed to be friend I'm telling you there is an unseen hand that guides us through of this weary land. There's an unseen hand that transported them. Storms in our day, they drive those ships on the rock. But storms in a Christian's life drives us to the rock. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Some say tear the old lighthouse down. I say crank her up again, praise God. Amen. I'm not on no apology tour going around telling you I've been scarred because I was raised in the Independent Baptist Church. I'm so glad I was born in the church I was born in. I'm not making apologies for them old preachers that stepped on a platform filled with the Holy Ghost and preached to us and pulled us out of hell. Thank God he got us where he wanted us to be. There was an unseen hand that transported them. Verse 2 there was an unexpected kindness that touched them. They called them barbarous people, barbarous people. The only reason they're called barbarous people is they didn't speak that Latin of the day. And the Bible said they showed us no little kindness. What about these, I mean, listen, 276 prisoners, soaking wet, stinking prisoners washed up on shore and these men were kind to them but there I could take you home to our place and I, I gotta hurry I wanna use this I wanna, I wanna make this point quickly there old brother old brother Lance Carpenter how many of you remember brother Lance Carpenter brother, brother, brother Doug you couldn't get around brother Lance Carpenter and your spirit not be refreshed in you he, he, he had a gift like no other to get up there with that 12 string guitar hit chords that you ain't never heard in your life and before you know it you wanted to worship with him he had a way of engaging people to worship with him there was a preacher down in our area had, had made some mistakes and had to step away from the ministry for a while Brother Lance picked up the telephone one afternoon. He said, hey, brother. He said, I'm, I've got a meeting over near your house. He said, you want to go to church with me? And that preacher just sort of broke down in tears. He said, Brother Lance, he said, I'm not ready to be around anybody yet. He said, I'm just working by myself. He said, I'm ashamed of the mistakes I've made. He said, I'm just not ready to be around anybody yet. Brother Lance said, that's okay. I'll be at your house in a few minutes. And you know, he drove that big old conversion van and, and Brother Mike, he got pulled up in that driveway and he got out of the car and I've unloaded that. I don't know how many times I've unloaded that conversion van. You go get that Taylor guitar out there and that amp and them CDs. But he didn't get all that out. He just got that guitar case and walked up to the door and knocked on the door. He said, Brother, I know you're not going to go with me. He said, but I, I came a little early so I just spent a little time with you. Brother Jeff, they said, oh, Brother Lance got over, there the, got over there in the man's living room. His family was gone. 
And this man, if I called his name, some of you would know he was, a, he, he was known for singing. He was a gifted singer. And old Brother Lance sat down on that, on that guitar, sat down on that couch and began to play that guitar, play them chords and got singing. And there that preacher was, Brother Rock, he thought, man, I don't know if I'd ever have a song again. Listen, some of us better realize this. Listen, birds don't sing because they've got answers. Birds sing because they got a song, praise God. If I wait to sing till I've got all the answers, I won't sing till I get a glorified body. Uh, but thank God there is a song uh, that's been buried deep in my spirit. He got to playing that, and that brother said, you know what, before I knew it, he said, that song was a welling up in me. And man... Old Brother Lance knew exactly what he was doing. He hit one of them chords. He said, hey, brother, how's this verse go? Brother Lance knew good and well how that verse went. He said, how'd it go? He said, sing a little bit for me. And before he knew it, that preacher, they didn't know if he'd ever have a song again, didn't know if he'd ever have joy again, didn't know if he'd ever be used again. All of a sudden, because a little saint of God came by to show him a little kindness, all of a sudden the tears began to flow and that song began to come off his lips. I tell you, some of us are here today because somebody came by our way, put their arm around us, encouraged us, when it was dark and we were down uh, maybe because of our own failure uh, maybe because we believed uh, of the lies of the devil uh, uh, but you and I can rejoice tonight uh, uh, we're in camp meeting uh, in Florence, Kentucky uh, because somebody uh, came by our way uh, and showed us no little kindness he was gone for a few days brother Doug he called that preacher back. Brother Lance said, you home? He said, yeah. He said, I'll be there in a minute. He pulled back up, knocked on the door, walked to the door. That preacher come to the door. He had an envelope. He said, here. He said, what's that? He said, that's my love offering. He said, I'm not taking that. He said, God told me to give it to you. Take it up with him and shut the door in his face. <laughs> huh? Listen, I know men fall to the place they may never get on a platform again. And we may never be able to restore them to service, but we can sure restore someone to fellowship. I hope, I hope I never go off the rails. I hope God help. I don't want to let your children down. I don't want to let my sons down. But Brother Daniel, man, if I go off the rails, I may never preach another message. I mean, man, I don't want to mess up. But dear time, if I get out, I listen, at least love me enough to knock on the door and say, preacher, whether you ever preach again, or whether you ever pastor again, I've just come to show you a little kindness. There was the storm that brought how much time I got, Brother Terry? All right, preacher. All right. I'm not, I, don't, I wouldn't take advantage. Listen to me. I wouldn't take advantage. Number two, quickly the situation that burned them. I want you to notice the adverse conditions. Look at verse two. The Bible said, because of the present rain and because of the cold. But Doug, you know why meetings are so important, these meetings? Camp meetings for a lot of part, except, with exception to the home church, are very much for other servants of God. And I wonder, come stand behind the pulpit, Brother Doug. I wonder if you could have spiritually, come help me, Brother Rocky. Brother Grace, come here and help me. I wonder if you could have seen a handful of these men of God walk in here tonight. Not with the facade they had on. But if you could have seen their spirit when they walked in, walked in here. And the next one come staggering in here. See, we don't know what that other brother's been going through. 
We don't know what storm they've been through. I don't care if it's a storm in their mind or if it's a storm in their church. It's a storm in their family. All of them wreak havoc in our spirit. All of them wreak havoc in our home. And we don't know what that is. And may I say there may be some of us coming tonight and we're battling the present cold and we're battling the rain. I'm talking about conditions that are adverse. I wish it was camp meeting every week. I wish it was revival every week. Oh, but honey, we're on a battlefield and people get shot and people bleed and people hurt and people get sick. I'm telling you, there's adverse conditions. Sometimes it's easy to sing. The only thing he bought was me. And there's other times you're so burdened. The devil's telling you, are you really even bought? Why well, do you preachers have heard him slip up in your ear? And say, boy, if you was a real preacher, you wouldn't be feeling like this. If you were the man of God that everybody said you are, you wouldn't be struggling like this. I'm so glad for an honest Bible. I'm so glad when I see John the Baptist over in jail saying, go down there and see if he's the one. Go down there and see if he's the one or do we seek another. I'm glad I got to 1 Kings 19 uh, where four verses after running the horses up back to Jezreel and Elijah's over there saying, Lord, just let me die. I'm not any better than my father's. I'm glad 2 Samuel 11 is in the Bible where we see the greatest of the greats uh, that are battling adverse conditions. I wish we were all always topping the hills but it's not that way I say it was difficult the first time you sang with Mike without Mike and then it got even more difficult even though your dad wasn't singing much he just wasn't there and even though you had to give your mom and them the words your mom the words it had to be mighty difficult when she wasn't on the platform for the first time. I'm talking about what you, what'd you stumble in here with? I mean, listen, hey, church member, is your Christian life just cold? Some of us got the idea the only way you can get cold is be out there drunk somewhere, doing dope, sleeping with another man's wife, out there, listen, living it up in sin. Hey, friends, you get cold in a Sunday school lecture. You get cold in a pulpit. You get cold in the choir. I'm talking about adverse conditions. What about this advantageous counsel? Notice what the Bible said. Look at verse 2. I'm hurrying. Preacher, you sit me down anytime and I'll quit. The Bible said that those men, they started a fire for him. Is that what it said? Yep. Look at your Bible now. Yep. What did it say? They did what? Did it say they started or kindled? All right, now kindle's a little different than started. Yep. Start, kindling is stoking a fire. Yep. It's not starting a fire. Now listen to me, friend. Jesus in heaven does not require you to start your own fire. Mine got started 37 years ago, about 12.15 on a Sunday morning, Faith Baptist Church in Gainesville, Georgia, when I got born again, amen, when the Spirit of God took residence in my soul. I mean, he lit a fire in me. It's not always been a raging forest fire, but thank God I didn't have to start it. The Lord does not require us to start our own fire. But he does require us to learn how to cultivate our own fire. Surely, when you look at verse 3, the Bible said that Paul sent one of them other prisoners to get the sticks. Surely, he looked at one of them Roman soldiers and said, Hey, boys, run out there and get some sticks. I mean, think about it. But the 275 men owed their life to Paul. Because that verse said, willing to save Paul. He told the ones that could swim, jump in and swim. And the others jump on a board. And it had been real easy for Paul just to say, hey guys, the fire's low. 
Go get some sticks. But what a lesson for us. Is that your daddy? I'd say for a lot of times as a young man, he carried the wood to your fire. And said, I would say as a young lady, through the years, your mom and your dad have carried wood to your fire. But there was one day you said, I do. And you promised to love her and to cherish her. No, that's not your wife. You ain't got a wife. I thought you said daughter-in-law. He's got two sons. Where's the married one? God help us. Boy, you should have seen him. He said, Son, where's she at? Ask God. Ask the Lord. Amen. Oh, God help us. Your brother said, I do. He just killed that illustration. God help, son. You got to learn how to play all. Amen. Hey, that's a whole different. Hey, you're you grown man though, aren't you? How old are you? 30. So somewhere along the way, you had to get the place in your own Christian walk that your daddy wasn't the one toting the wood. And said somewhere along the way, you've had to get to the place where mom wasn't the one coating the wood. See, the problem is, I don't know much about Methodist people, Catholic people, and Presbyterian people, but I know something about Baptist people. And I'm not saying this arrogantly, but Rocky, I spend about every night of my life with some Baptist people. Most people get their blessings by proxy. There's members of the Emmanuel Baptist Church, members of the, of the Wahoo Baptist Church, members of the Heritage Baptist Church, members of the Calvary Baptist Church. They get happy when we get happy. They get happy when that old saint of God gets happy. They get happy when the youth director gets happy. They get happy when this one gets happy or that one gets happy. Let me ask you something. When's the last time you got happy all by yourself? When's the last time, Brother Doug, I didn't have to go out there and get some wood when, you, when your wood was burning low and have to put some wood on it? When's the last time you came to church and you felt like your fire was burning low and you said, I don't care if anybody else moves. I don't care if anybody else prays. I'm going to get my own wood. Amen. Amen. You know what would be a good thing on this first night of meeting? Some of us have stumbled in here. And some of us need to go get some wood. I'm done right here. Number three, the shipwreck that brought them, the situation that burdened them, but there was a snake that bit them. A snake that bit them. And Brother Doug, I believe with all my heart, you can disagree with me, and I, I'm not going to get offended. But I believe with all my heart that viper was in that wood that Paul picked up. Yeah. We're, in the, we're still in the, I know we're in Cincinnati, we're still in the country. I drove through the country today. I live on a farm at home. Snakes don't hibernate. They brumate. They're cold natured, and when it's cool, they don't move quickly. My, 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 my wife's cousin lived right out the road from about 15, 20 years ago. He was walking about early April. He was walking down his steps barefooted in, barefooted in, the, in his basement. Stepped down on a, on a step, stepped on a copperhead, jumped back up four and a half foot copperhead laying on his steps. I went to heaven right there. <laughs> Sing a verse of Lord, I'm coming home. I'm like Jerry Clower, friend. I like graveyard dead snakes. My dad said, son, when I was a boy, your papa used to keep two king snakes in a corn crib. I said, daddy, I don't have a corn crib, but I don't need two king snakes. Right, right. Amen. Hey. I'm Baptist, praise God. We don't have those vipers. Right, right. Here's the kicker. I believe with all my heart, when he threw that wood on that fire, it was that fire that Paul needed is what brought that viper alive. I hear people say, well, praise God, we ain't got no snakes in our place. Might be because you ain't got fire at your place. 
Ain't no snakes at our place, preacher. It might be time to build a fire. Everybody okay? See, you let it get hot enough, the snakes will crawl. I've never been in a hay field. I've never been in a hay field in May or June or late August. I've never put a mower in a hay field that I didn't kill a rattlesnake or a copperhead at our place. You know why? Because it's hot. And when it gets hot, they crawl. I wonder how many of us come to, to camp meeting this year. And you've been around the fire. But there's a viper come out and bit you. See, the problem with our vipers are, and sometimes us preachers are the worst. We're like, like if we go have lunch tomorrow, we'll get out there and get talking about everything that's happened in the last year. And that's one of us will say, boy, we had some real trouble at our church. And then the preacher right down there, hey, look at here, my viper's longer than yours. Mine's got more rattles than yours. Mine was longer than yours. My bite lasted longer than yours. My arms swell more than yours. You know what a lot of us have done? Instead of shaking it off, we have coddled it. And if we're not careful, that viper that came out of that fire that we were trying to build in our life has become our identity. You'd say, Brother Doug, I'd serve God, but look at here, I got bit. Preacher, I'd run a bus router. I'd, I'd preach or I'd sing in the choir, but look at here. How many of us preachers, we make excuses, boy, if I hadn't have got bit at our place, we'd be having a revival. Listen, if you've been in the ministry, I, if I could look at Brother Doug's hands and arms or any of you men of God that's been in this thing for any kind of time frame, there'd be little, there'd be little puncture marks. And if you've got a preacher that's been in the ministry any kind of time, you better thank God that he got bit, but somewhere he decided not to quit. I know, listen, the greatest people in God's, on God's earth are in our churches. There's a few meanings, too. They're the exception. Amen. That's your daughter-in-law, but that's not his wife. I, I guarantee you, if I leave this meeting with anything, I know that ain't your wife, praise God. <laughs> Dear time, Brother Ledbetter. Some of y'all needed to laugh because I... The Lord of God's done nailed you a little bit right there. See them vipers, as long as they're latched on, they're pumping you full of venom. And see, there's sometimes kids get bit. And sometimes preacher's wives. And deacons and deacon's wives and evangelists. And preachers and servants and leaders. See, what's going to dictate how you go forward is how quickly... You choose to shake it off. I didn't say, I didn't say it didn't hurt. I, I, I didn't say it didn't come out of nowhere and you might not have deserved it. But see, what happens is if we don't shake it off, we'll never move forward because we're always wanting to show somebody our viper. And some of us are here tonight for the simple reason some of us got bit last year. But we didn't quit. And some of you got bit the year before, the year before. My question is tonight, who you want to sing, preacher? Miss Henson, Henson, y'all come back. And preacher, I wouldn't disrespect, if you hadn't told me to preach on, I'd have sat down. I would never disrespect that time. But I wonder on this first night of meeting, I wonder how many of us would be honest and say, Preacher, I came to this meeting struggling with the present cold and the rain. Man, sometimes burdens just get heavy. I mean, 2020, my mom, my dad went to heaven December 13th. My mom went to heaven December the 25th. I remember my mom, my wife doesn't do that, but my mom did. And she would, she would, before she got sick, she would, she would iron my handkerchiefs and just stack them up in the pulpit. And I got down to the last one, Sister Foster, and I never moved it because I knew my mom had put it there. 
And it wasn't long after she went to heaven. Somebody didn't do it on purpose. But I just looked down there while I was preaching and realized it was gone. And it just reminded me again, she was gone. My sister looked at me when we left that cemetery. She said, Mark, she said, you know that we are leaving the graveside of the very last person on the face of this earth that will love us unconditionally. I mean, I've been with my wife, my wife and I 32 years, been married 28 years. We, we dated for four years and she loves me and I love her. But the truth is, if I went crazy, I could hurt her enough that she might not love me anymore. But a parent will always love you. And it may, it may not have been somebody being mean. It might have been a death. I, I, I think about the Bordens. I, I, it, it, it might have been a, it might have been your pastor of the church and the Lord sent your only helper out to pastor another church and now you're under that load again. I don't know what it is that bit you. And I don't know what it is that you've just got the news your dad went to heaven. Come to, she came to the meeting for the fire. And out of nowhere. You know, sometimes if you were old enough, you might see folks mistreat your dad. And he'll get through it. And a lot of times he can forgive them because we, that's what we have to do. But that's your daddy. You don't really have to. You can take somebody out behind the woods, whip them, and then tell them you forgive them. And I'll hold them. But if you're not careful, it'll latch on. I've seen that with my own wife. Go through some difficulties at church. And she says, how can you move on? I said, Mama, my, my heart's just safely trusting you. And I said, you're protecting my heart. I said, but you're going to have to shake it off. I wonder who I'm talking to this morning, I, this evening. Wouldn't it be a good night, the first service of this great meeting, just to say, preacher? See, the only thing that keeps a lot of us from coming down here is our pride. We, we don't want these other men to think, well, I'm cold. I'm a little cold. I'm, I'm struggling. Let me tell you, they ain't, they ain't one of us in here that don't put your britches on or your dress on the same way as everybody else that don't have difficult times. And the first step to you shaking that thing off is just saying, I've been bit. I've been bit. And if I had to, if I had to physically come down here, I hear about old brother Sammy, Shake it off. Shake it off. If I had to do that in my spirit to get that viper off me, there's no telling how good this camp meeting would be in your soul. Some of you may not need to come shake the steak off. Some of you just might need to get a little wood. And say for the first time, if no other preacher gets happy, if no other choir member gets happy, if no other person in our church gets happy, I'm getting happy. I'm putting some fire. I'm putting some wood on my own fire. Let's stand. They're going to sing. Would you mind the Lord tonight? Man, some of us have come a long way. You didn't come this way not to get help. You didn't come this long way not to shake it off. Would you come? Would you come? It don't matter what snake it was. Here it is. Preacher, I got bit, but I don't want to quit. Sing on, ladies. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.